The following interview was conducted with Olivia Bennett Wood for the Purdue University Libraries. It takes place on August 28, 2013 in the Stewart Center. The interviewer is Stephanie Schmitz. Welcome. So during your previous interview, we heard a lot about your education and how you came to Purdue and some highlights and your work at Purdue. And I think one of your interesting accomplishments involves developing an interdisciplinary course for pharmacy, dietetics, and nursing. How did that come about? That was so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, and kind of interesting because of the way that it was set up, I hear now that that would be frowned on here. So anyway, mm -hmm. well, um, I had gotten, I'm a registered dietitian, mm -hmm. and I had gotten to know people in pharmacy and people in nursing and, and actually mainly through the teaching academy, okay? Um, and Nick Popovich, who uh, was in pharmacy at that time, he's now left Purdue, um, and, and Joe Brooks, who's now retired, she was in nursing, and um, a person from uh, Health and Human Services, I don't know, if Randy, what was his last name? I don't know if he's still here or not, but he would be retirement age and me. We just kind of got the idea of putting our students together. So a class where there would be dietitians, pharmacists, and they would all be seniors, nurses, and health educator fitness. Because they deal with the same clients. Mm -hmm. And when they leave Purdue and they go for their internship or uh, graduate work after BS, they have to work in teams. And they had no experience working in teams with pharmacists, nurses, uh -huh. health. And so um, everybody was really excited about it. We did it totally on our own time because we were all four. We met once a week for two hours. And we were all four, all four professors were in the class at the same time. So we could model what would happen to the students. And I hear that that's kind of being frowned now, not considered efficient. Okay. That it's okay to have um, guest professors come in and do a lecture or whatever, but you shouldn't have four professors in the class at oh, the same time. Resources. Anyway, resources. <laughs> but anyway, we were doing it volunteer, and it went, I guess we did it for four or five years. And um, we limited it to five seniors from each program. So there were five teams, and we would give them a case study, very similar to what they would get in a dietetic internship if they were a dietitian or in nursing. And the case study and in today's life, there isn't a medical problem that doesn't have all of those components. Mm -hmm. So the case study would probably be a patient, like a cardiovascular patient who needed a fitness program, was on new medications, was on a special diet, and had nursing care. Oh, wow. Okay. And all of those had to be coordinated. Oh. And the students then would work on that case study and present each one, each group had a different case study several times, they had four during the semester, and they would present to the whole class. Okay. Anyway, and then um, it, it was enormous fun, and there really was some, not, a nice scholarly approach that came out of it, because we published what we did. Is that right? Okay, yeah. Did, did other institutions follow in suit? I do not know. If they did, they didn't contact us. But, and mm -hmm. we also developed um, a, um, a huge, number of um, evaluation forms and that kind of, of thing. And um, um, I'm almost sure they didn't, which is kind of sad. Yeah. But we had it in, a, in a, a pharmacy journal and a nursing journal. And then we each presented it in our own professional meeting as an individual. Mm -hmm. And I had a, I, actually, I did get a request for handouts from that because we didn't copyright the handouts. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a lot of interest, but mostly the other dietetic professors around the country couldn't believe that we would give our own time to do that. But we were that committed. And it's interesting. We were that committed to it. And there's such a push for inter interdisciplinary. interdisciplinary. And I understand that they're talking about something like that again, but yeah. they might um, uh, change the way that it's done mm -hmm. since there's some concern about inefficiency yeah. or whatever. And you'd have to have somebody willing to. We did it on top of 
every, and we all had very full academic loads and we did it on top because we believed in it. And both you and the students. Had yes, fun. yes. Wonderful. Yeah. And it, you know, one thing led to another. I just got the brochure about the back to the classroom mm -hmm. classes for President's Council mm -hmm. Day. We presented at that. Oh, cool. And we had majors from all four come and they were just thrilled and they thought it was such a good idea. Just one thing led to another. That's great. And you were also involved with the Indiana Governor's Council for Physical Fitness and Sports Medicine. Yes. What was that? Well, that, and I don't believe that initiative exists anymore either. Uh, that was uh, when I first was here in the mid-70s, and it was uh, Governor Bowen, who was a physician. I mm -hmm. uh, saw where he recently passed away. Um, he was interested in health and fitness, and they're actually... At that time, there was not the terrible statistics that there are right now mm -hmm. about weight concern in Indiana mm -hmm. among the citizens. He just was really interested in that. And so he put together a governor's council, and there were about 20 of us on it, and there were two of us from Purdue. One was um, Dr. Ishmael, who, was, uh, who is now deceased, and he was a professor in health and kinesiology, and he was very well known. And I was the other one uh, in nutrition. And then there were um, fitness people from other universities, and the person that coordinated it was the um, director of public health, Indiana director of public health. And we met four times a year mm -hmm. in Indianapolis. And what came out of that group was a booklet for citizens of where all the fitness type education places were. At that time, there weren't new tones there wasn't all of the ones that are so widely mm -hmm. advertised in everyone's personal marketplace. Yes. And so um, we thought the best thing we could do is let people know where these facilities were that were, that had appropriate professionals because yeah. there was a, a lot of charlatan people calling themselves oh, trainers and really? nutritionists and um, because some of those terms have licensure associated uh -huh. with them and some do not. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm not sure that's as bad today because today that's a thriving major. It sure is. Yeah. yeah. In health and fitness and in nutrition science, the department that I used to be in when it was foods and nutrition. And so those students go out well trained to be personal trainers and mm -hmm. fitness, but that didn't exist in 1970. Okay. okay. That was 40 years ago. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. And then you are also a faculty fellow. Yes. Can you talk about those experiences? Okay. Well, that's, that's just a fun thing. I think the students recommend you, and what you do is um, you are welcome. You, you're assigned to a certain residence hall. Mm -hmm. um, and before that, I was an advisor at Twin Pines Cooperative, mm -hmm. which was uh, solely home economics students. Okay. I'm not sure if it still exists, but it, I think or, it's still around. Yeah, but it may not be solely home economics yeah. students. And um, you're welcome for lunch or dinner anytime and if you can go at least once a week, they love it and you just you're just there to talk with the students. Is that right? Just you're not really there time. as an academic advisor, you're not there as a prof, you're just there as a go between. Okay. Uh, to make um, them have a more personal relationship with a faculty member if they want one. Okay. You know. So just have dinner every once in yeah, a while. Yeah. And you know, they because of that you get invited to all of their functions and everything. Oh, yeah. And sometimes you get asked to sit in on uh, um, whatever their administrative thing is. But okay. basically you're just there to be a friend outside the classroom. All right. And I, I hope they still have those. They do. A lot of people did back fellows. And if you if you if you're one, then you get a free pass to the dining hall. Oh, do you? <laughs> okay, okay. Incentives. Um, yeah. Well, okay. Um, you have received so many teaching awards over the years. What is the secret to your success? I think getting to know the students because I. I hope that I did a good job in the classroom, but I think a good teacher is so much more. Okay. Um, um, 
I had a very, I had an open door. I was there by 7.30 in the morning and I was there till five and the door was open all the time. Mm -hmm. And certainly students would make formal appointments, especially mm -hmm. during registration time. Back then, faculty registered students. Today they register themselves. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so it was a little bit, it was a little different. And um, I think today they have to meet with an advisor before they can register themselves. But back then, they had to be registered with a faculty or, or a faculty who also was an advisor, and I was. Mm -hmm. And I relished that role because I was in charge of the dietetics curriculum, and I was the one that best could answer their questions, where can the profession take you, mm -hmm. or, or, and they would say, Ms. Wood, I want to do this, or I want to do that, and I could say, well, this is where you need to go looking for your internship, this is what mm -hmm. they're going to want, this is what they're going to look for, and and um, that tied in, um, this is kind of getting away from the teaching, but I think the students saw me as their advocate, as well as in the classroom, and I also t was on a 100% teaching appointment, and then I participated in research three months in the summer. Oh. So back when I was hired, almost everybody was hired for 12 months. I think that's changed as well. And I participated in research in the summer, but during the year I taught four or five courses. Wow. So when we did the interdisciplinary course, it was course number six. Ooh. Okay. Well, uh, and so they saw me a lot. I, I t tended to teach the introductory course where they would get to know me, but then they had me for their senior courses. And I was also the person that worked with them to get their dietetic internship, which was after their bachelor's degree. And getting that internship is paramount in dietetics mm -hmm. because it's the only way you could eventually get to the credential. And um, I, I think that that had a lot to do with it. I love to teach. I don't well, have a um, passive personality, so I was very gregarious and uh -huh. I love to teach and I, so I, I like that part of it. So when you first came to Purdue, you hadn't taught before that. I had taught for one year. Oh, at, okay. At Meredith That's College right. in Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, I was in, an, in a, a position for a year or so that the professor could finish her PhD. Uh -huh. So I knew that it was just for a year when I took it. And when you took that position, what kind of resources does a dietitian have for teaching? Because a dietitian knows how to be a dietitian. Right, right. But the same you, resources that anybody does. You, you locate, and I was aware, I didn't have a degree in education. Mm -hmm. I'd never written an exam question. I'd yeah. fussed a lot about, about exam questions, but I'd never written one. And so um, uh, she left me all of her materials uh -huh. because she was just gone for that year, uh -huh. okay? And, and your first couple of years are the hardest you will ever work. I, I can remember spending all Sunday afternoon. Oh. I quickly found out I could teach the same material she taught, but I couldn't use her lectures. They had to be mine. Yeah. And you got to start from scratch. You have to start from scratch. And I can remember sitting all afternoon on Sunday afternoon making outlines and writing out lectures. And oh. you first start out writing them out. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a computer then and you learn I need X number legal size pages for fifty minutes. I mean you have to learn all that. In, yeah, you have to learn that, but but that, then that doesn't change. You don't have to learn that again. That's right. Okay, and so when I came to Purdue, I actually took a number of courses in education on exam construction and student evaluation, and they were extremely helpful. And that was okay. in the education department. Yes, so they just do have those classes. oh yes, they have those for teachers. Oh, okay. Yeah, and actually, I think they're five hundred level courses. Okay. Okay. So. Um, there were people in the class who um, graduated in something like biology but didn't do the education degree and they were back to get the education mm -hmm. degree. Mm -hmm. And so they were, they, they were excellent courses and the teachers were excellent. I learned a lot from the teachers. So I got comfortable with those kinds of things. Okay. What I, one of the things you did was construct a test and then it would be evaluated objectively as to its um, how difficult it was or how easy and you would learn about how to make the four choices on a multiple choice mm -hmm. relatively challenging okay. so there wouldn't be two that they could just immediately yeah. say well it's not this 
There's someone behind that. Yeah, yeah. so there are, res <laughs> there are resources, and I, I um, at a large campus like this, there are lots of resources. Okay. okay. And so once I won an award, and I was, um, uh, I don't know if it's an election or what, and well, the if you win a university award, you're automatically in the Purdue Teaching Academy. Mm -hmm. And that didn't start till the mid-1990s. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, linked at the same time around that time, and I think the name may have changed, the Center for Instructional Excellence, yes. is that still the same name? Mm -hmm. They have wonderful resources. And I started doing workshops for them on test construction or course evaluation construction and I've always shared everything I developed mm -hmm. uh, uh, with people. You know, I had a form where a student could come in and go through their test and answer why, help them figure out why they missed it. And I developed that out of my own uh, wanting to defend myself to the students if mm -hmm. they didn't do well. And they would see right away, oh well, I didn't go quite far enough or I would have known this or, oh. or Anyway. Okay. And did you have any mentors over the course of your career that you were? The, the Department of Foods and Nutrition w had a lot of excellent teachers. When I came here, a, a woman who's a, about six years older, Karen Jamison, had just won the, uh, at then it was the Elliott Teaching Award. It's now the Murphy. Uh, when I wanted it was something else. It's now the Murphy. Um, and she, um, she um, looking on here to see, I got the name down somewhere. But anyway, um, and Mary Fuqua before her, who mm -hmm. had then become a dean, had won that award. Okay. And two other people in the department had won that award. So our department was really kind of known on campus for having outstanding teachers. Okay. And, um, Connie Weaver, the current department head, has won that award. So it sounds like the department. So the department, they do, and I think that that's I think that that's very important. I was on a hundred percent teaching appointment, and my department head valued good teaching, okay. and that's got to be part of the process, you know. Gotcha. So, and then what about being an environment? It seems like the environment where you worked was there was many females. But what about like broader and the university, the dynamic between male professors and female professors? You know, I never got caught up in that if it existed, okay? Um, we did have a pretty 50-50 balance in my department. And part of that was probably because it was in home economics and there were more women initially in home economics. Mm -hmm. But as the School of Consumer and Family Sciences grew, uh, there were actually more men because we were looking in for people with heavy bench research and practical research kinds mm -hmm. of questions. And, and a lot of them seemed to be men, okay. Mm -hmm. the, only, the only dynamic that I'm um, aware of that was uh, very poor and it took forever to be corrected, and I hope that it is. I don't really know that it is. There was quite a salary difference between men and women. Is that right? Yeah. And um, I, I guess I'd been here 20 or 25 years before they, maybe it was when computers came in, before they started releasing the salary report every year, because uh -huh. it's, it's public knowledge yeah. since we were a state university. I don't remember seeing that when I was first here, but I was so busy, maybe mm -hmm. I just didn't pay attention to it. But once they started releasing that, it was really obvious that men and women in the same department with the same rank mm -hmm. and virtually the same assignments and the same experience were paid very differently. And, wow. uh, and were you ever involved on the council status on women? I think they were. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. no. I had department heads that valued teaching, and um, I, I was fortunate to always receive raises. Um, I came in lower, mm -hmm. and so see, when you come in lower, it doesn't matter. You really can't ever hardly get up there. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, 
And I know that they worked very hard to try to be fair because they had to take from somebody if they were going to give somebody more. And I think that I, I, I had excellent ones. Um, and they were, very, they were very fair. I never got up to where most of the guys were, but neither was I bringing in money. Okay. Okay, so um, I had a, such a heavy teaching load, and most of them didn't because they were bringing in research dollars mm -hmm. and they had salary savings from those. Okay. And actually, their salary savings often funded my teaching assistance. Oh, really? Yeah, so it's all... Kind of connected. It's all connected. It's it, there. Every everything's a piece part of it. I mean, there isn't a rule that you've got to bring in so many, or you won't have a teaching assistant. Mm -hmm. But when you have as many classes as I had, and some of my classes were labs, you have to have teaching assistants. Mm -hmm. So the teaching assistants came out of the pot of money that was available, and the money coming into that, I wasn't out writing the grants for. Mm -hmm. So I. I Titles didn't really matter that I loved what I was doing. I got positive feedback all the time from my students. I, um, it was not unusual for us to have 95 or 100 percent get a dietetic internship, and it was one of the top universities in the country that was getting that many people in. And so um, I was happy. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> and. What did you find most challenging and most re most challenging and also most rewarding during your time at Purdue? I think challenging was um, the level of brightness of our students and just constantly staying on top and uh -huh. ahead of them. Okay, they, they were very bright, and mm -hmm. I'm bright, but many of them were very bright, yeah. much brighter than I was, okay, and I constantly staying on keep top it of, on your toes. keep it on my toes, there's, and, and I think that that was rewarded through the, through the awards, I think, teach, I think the students know right away who's not really interested in them, mm. uh, who's just there putting in their 50 minutes, who's never available, um, those kinds of things. I, th I think all that comes, I think all that comes into it. Okay. Okay. Now, the most, uh, that was challenging, um, but you also asked for the most Reward. rewarding. Well, that was the most rewarding as well as the challenging. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, is there, any one event in particular during your time at Purdue that stands out in your memory is ingrained on your mind? Well, there can be more than one if you want. Well, uh, one uh, thing that pops in my mind is it has nothing to do with ac academics, but it was in the, was it the 80s when, um, all the, uh, we were trying to save electricity, and um, all of the lights in the rooms, at least one level of lights was taken away, and the campus was darker at night. Oh. Fortunately, there weren't any problems, but they were really trying to save energy, and I, you know, I can't remember what sparked that, but it was national. Huh. It was just a real cutback, okay. And yet, uh, another one is going to the Rose Bowl. Yeah. That was just so exciting. I, my, I, my husband and I are both Purdue football fans uh -huh. and basketball fans. I came from a basketball state, okay. North Carolina. Yeah. So when I, um, but anyway, I became a football fan here. And um, I was fortunate enough to be on some unusual committees. And one of them toward the very end of my time here was the Athletic Affairs Committee. Really? And I, for, and I chaired it for, you usually, you're on it for five years and you usually move up to be chair the fifth year. But I ended up chairing for two years because the a, a person that was supposed to do it became the Big Ten rep. Oh. And um, it happened to be during Joe Tenner, Tiller's tenure here uh -huh. and we were going to all these bowl games. Wow. And so, uh, but the Rose Bowl was just um, so exciting because I'd grown up not interested in the football game, but watching the parade. Oh, 
I'd watch that parade every New Year's Day for 20 or 30 years, and to be able to see it was so exciting. And then a number, um, our faculty was a, a, a real family. Uh -huh. And um, we have a, a group called Corporate Affiliates, which are vice presidents and CEOs, there's about 20 of them, from various food and nutrition companies, like even Coca-Cola, Pepsi, they could be competing, Tropicana, Nestle, whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, the Nestle office in America is in Los Angeles. And that corporate affiliate got those of us that were going, there were six of us that went from the department and our spouses, um, uh, tickets to uh, help decorate the floats. No yeah, I mean, so there's no way that the, that the Rose Bowl can't stand out because of the parade. Anyway, so we went a day early and we were assigned to a certain warehouse. They had the floats are all over the area of Los Angeles. Wow. And lo and behold, when we got there, it was the warehouse that had the Big Ten float. Oh. Yeah. And the Big Ten float is the same every year. It's a great big helmet in whatever colors. And so it was a great big helmet, and it was all, we'd put gold mums all over it. It was all, because it was gold and black since uh -huh. we were in the game. Uh -huh. And it was also, and that was just luck. I don't think the corporate affiliate had anything to do with it. It was just luck that we got assigned there. And that was also the warehouse where they had the float that had the, um, and it's not the maitre d', what do you call the person who leads the parade? The parade. Anyway, it's a famous person every year, and oh, it was yes. Bob Hope. Mm -hmm. That float, he rode on a Jeep that was camouflaged, <laughs> all camouflaged, and it was all seeds and seeds? grasses. It looked like fatigue, like army camouflage clothes. What year was that? Was that in Desert Storm year? No, no. Uh, this was. Um, when Drew Brees was here. So this was about 10 years ago. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. In fact, Bob Hope died about three or four years after that. We didn't see him. This is just the float that he rode on. Okay. okay and it was a big Jeep uh -huh. made up all camouflaged. And, um, and, and it was just aesthetically fascinating because they're not all flowers. There are a lot of seeds and grasses. The rule is it just has to be live plant material. Exactly. So it can be uh, actually not live. It can be a spice. It could be paprika. Oh, yeah. It could be hundreds of pounds of paprika to get that color or sage or, or something. Or I didn't realize until recently that there was actual flowers used to that all there are there's nothing artificial all the flowers are real and at this warehouse there's boy and girl scouts that are pinching off blooms then it, then another table is putting them in these those little tiny individual water things is that how they say then that's that? what sticks on the float because really? the flowers after we didn't do this but but after the parade the public can pay to go see the floats and they raise a lot of money that way. The floats are all paid for by whoever's sponsoring them. Okay. I don't have a clue what the big pen pays for this, but it, theirs is the same, so they're not paying design fees. Uh -huh. There's a theme every year, so all the other companies are paying a designer to build it for them. Okay. And I think they're quite costly. Hmm. But anyway, they are real flowers and so there's there's a hundred people at this warehouse doing various parts. How many hours did you spend? We were there from about eight in the morning till about four that afternoon. Ooh. Yeah. Just we on. just yeah, we've got great pictures. Oh, cool. It was really cool. Interesting. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. So that has to stick out. Yeah. Yeah. Now Katie or your your favorite Purdue tradition already came up. But I was wondering how your transition from North Carolina culture to Midwestern culture happened and how you made friends and how you acclimated to yeah. the new department. I think, well, remember I'd only taught for a year and I had worked as a research dietitian for two years before that. And um, so I didn't have a lot of preconceived ideas about a department 
and um, ha about how that functioned. I was in a small department of home economics in at Meredith College in Raleigh, North Carolina, and there was one foods and nutrition teacher, and it was me. Wow. And there was a clothing teacher, and there was an interior design and a housing, and that was it. Okay, and a department head. Okay, so I came in here to everyone was in foods and nutrition and at that time it was 15 or something mm -hmm. okay um, so it all of a sudden I was around all my own people that were trained the same yeah. way that I was and that was super okay and I'm probably a bloom where you're planted I won't tell you that I didn't severely miss I, I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina mm -hmm. and I went to school in the Piedmont section and so it was kind of a culture shock. I remember flying up for the interview, and at that time, um, there's so many things that don't exist anymore. At that time, you flew to Chicago and you took Air Wisconsin down. Oh, really? And, and Air Wisconsin flew to Chicago three or four times a day from the Purdue Airport. Okay, it was a regular commuter so you came flight. So I came in to the Purdue Airport, and on the way from Chicago, on Air Wisconsin, I guess it didn't get that high since it wasn't but an hour flight or something. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen it, it, and it was in May, and all the fields were bare. Oh. Because they were just getting planted, yeah. and I'd never seen that before because oh. I came from the mountains yeah. and the Piedmont. And so I thought, oh my gosh. And I got here, and it was the week after graduation, and the campus was totally dead. Uh -huh. It's the one week that's there's nobody here. Yeah. And I remember I, I stayed in the union and I remembered, I thought, well, it didn't get dark till eight or nine yeah. o'clock and, uh -huh. and it was in May. And I walked out and I walked up to Mackey and I didn't know what Mackey was. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh, what's that big round building? And well, later I found out, you know, that was Mackey. But um, I acclimated well quickly. It was okay. a Yeah. Transition. People loved my accent because I was the only one with it. And the students from the southern half of in Indiana had no problem understanding me because my accent has a lot of Kentucky and West Virginia in it because I was in the mountains. Uh -huh. It's it's more of a hillbilly kind of accent huh. than a true southern okay. in a way. And so if if they were from the southern part of Indiana, I just sounded like home to them. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and you know, I was very young. I was not married. Um, How old were you when you did? 27. 27. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, first of all, had an apartment, and then I moved to a duplex that was still rented. And then I, uh, after I married, we bought a home. And um, I, um, I was the youngest person in the department. It was, um, was that it was the early '70s, and mini skirts were still in, uh -huh. and I looked different. <laughs> did you Did you have to wear skirts? I mean, the students, I did. The students had to wear their skirts. And I don't remember their restrictions. I do for my undergraduate. Oh, for yeah. my undergraduate, we had to wear black dresses to anything that happened. Our big. Uh, entertainment place was also called Elliot oh. at the University of North Carolina Greensboro and you didn't go in there without a black dress on the little black dress you know wow. whether you were going to uh, they have a music school so we had operas and uh -huh. things like that all the time and you didn't go there for anything and you did not go in the home economics building with slacks on oh, that really? was just an unspoken rule and I never I don't think I ever saw it written down anywhere that's but but was. that's how it was. Yeah. But by the time I got here, jeans weren't in for girls here. Oh. Now this was 1973. Uh -huh. But slacks were. And it's colder up here. Yeah. So I don't know if that's why or not. Well, some of the women in the Mario Matthews club, it would be interesting just to get three or four of the older ones together to tell you stories. They do remember when they had fairly severe dress restrictions. And I don't think it's because they were in home economics. Almost all of them went to Purdue uh -huh. as well as then worked at Purdue. Uh, I think it was just girls. I think it was just... Is that right? Yeah. I think it was just the way girls um, dressed. And, and, and um, at that time, they all majored in 
teaching or home economics. Mm -hmm. The girls didn't go into engineering or mm -hmm. anything. And I know I've read a little bit about Amelia Earhart, and they said one of the reasons she was so um, magnetic was girls flocked to her because she was different, mm -hmm. because she was doing things they didn't think that they could have done. Yeah, and she made it so cool. Yes, and I think I heard a story from one of the women. She may have been, uh, she was a guest uh, speaker. She wasn't really a prof, I don't think. I think she may have been one of the first female to ever wear pants on campus. I think I heard a story about that. I heard that she walked into dinner once and really shocked a lot of people because she wore pants. Okay, maybe that's where my story uh -huh. heard from. It's, but And it's so interesting. I, I don't think, it's so interesting. I don't think that she opened up, but it was a shock because those things weren't important to her. Uh -huh. Okay, and and there may have been a little side of her that would have done it just for the shock factor. I don't, uh -huh. I don't, I don't know. But um, it was, Purdue's always been considered conservative, and it was, I went to an all-woman's college. It was co-ed when I went, but it had just been an all-woman's college. Okay. It was Woman's College of the University of North Carolina when mm -hmm. I applied, and when I entered, it was University of North Carolina Greensboro. So we didn't have oh, any men wow. on campus. We had no uh, residence halls for men. It huh. was all women. Men started taking classes, but, now it's a totally co-ed campus, yeah. but yeah. Um, anyway, that would be fun before some of those alums that are 70, 80, 90, and you know you could do that during a President's Council, have an open forum and just put out some questions and have people come. And have a recorder there. It's that informal conversation. It would that's, really be interesting. Be cool. It would be a cute little book. Yeah. You know, that's probably not written down anywhere. It's probably not. Do you think they would write their memories down? Uh, they might. And if, but if they didn't mind being recorded, you could write that's them up. That's true. Yeah. And, I, and one person to, um, um, in fact, you might ask her if she's covering that in her book. Angie's book that's to come out in yeah. 2014 is about the five dean of yes. students, the women dean of students. And they went, she's collected information as far back as she could and interviewed people like Eva Goebel and all. They might have some stories, they might have some stories, that might be a good question. Okay. What do you remember girls wearing or were that? I don't think it was written down, I think it's just what women did. You don't remember anything. My students all wore skirts. Is that right? Yeah. Till about 80, but I could totally be wrong on the, the, that. Because mm -hmm. I just come out of the decade of the 60s mm -hmm. where everything was being stretched by students mm -hmm. because of the war and the everything. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any memories of um, who would have been the dean of students back then? Was it Bar Be Beverly Stone? At the it, the no, it was... Uh, Betty? No, Not it yet. was before Betty. Was Betty was Beverly before Betty? I, Betty Be or was Beverly? Stratton? Where was Stratton? She's first. Okay, well then it wasn't her. Barbara Cook. Do you remember? It was Bar. It may have been Barbara Cook. Do you remember anything? Hearing anything about those women? Do you know? No, I actually, and I, I would, I can look up the year, and then we could figure out which one it is. I actually made an appointment with one of them. Sometime in the like 78, 79, and I, I, I would know the year because the reason I made the appointment is I was becoming really active in my professional association at mm -hmm. that time, the American Dietetic Association, and um, uh, I was on the Commission on Dietetic Registration, which is the body that credentials registered dietitians, and we were. Um, looking into what we, uh, what we could and couldn't do with privacy acts. When could we use somebody's social security number? Mm -hmm. This is when all that was started. And I went over and interviewed the dean of students, and I could, but I don't remember, uh, just to see what the laws were. Uh -huh. 
we each had an assignment and I took that one. I said, uh, well, I'll go back to Purdue and I hear the Dean of Students is a really nice lady and I haven't met her. And so I called her up and I spent about three hours in her office. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. And I think it was Barbara Cook. Okay. She was so nice. She told me what, at that time, everybody's social security number was used for everything. Yeah. And she, she, um, she first saw that coming and advised me, tell your group, just not even to go there, mm -hmm. to come up with some other number, and we did. Okay, way before, at, way before they took it off your driver's license and everything else. Yeah. I mean that still was going on when Dr. Jitsky was here. At, when I was uh, when I was in school, yeah, I, re I remember it was still on our health card or something, yeah. and he saw it on his and had a fit because he <laughs> thought they'd gotten it off of uh -huh. everything in the university system. And um, anyway, she was very very helpful. You okay. know, and she, uh, even things like what's public knowledge, like the student's phone number, if they agreed, could be uh -huh. in the campus book, but nothing else. Not not where they lived. At, at one point where they lived couldn't be in there. Uh -huh. So no Tom, Duck, Dick, and Harry could come look up where you lived yeah. or whatever, yeah. but yeah. they could look at your phone number unless you had blocked it. Uh -huh. She told me all of Wow. Those kinds of things, which my national group really needed to know. Yeah, neat. Anyway, and she was tall and thin, big boned. That must have been Beverly. Beverly yeah, was tall. may have been Beverly. She was kind of big boned, broad shoulder. Do you remember anything about the social culture of your students? Um, you, did you not you really? Get yeah, being a fact fella, I saw them. That's one of the advantages of the fact fella is you see them outside your office in the classroom, uh -huh. and that was personally really helpful to me because I had to write recommendations about them, uh -huh. and it was helpful for me to have something other than she was always on time for class, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. to have something that was uh, not private but was personal. Exactly. You know, um, you know, like if you saw one of your students in the residence hall help a handicapped person, mm -hmm. I'd put that in a letter. I, yeah. I witnessed it, and it wasn't because I was witnessing it, and it gives that student a edge. Yeah, it gives them a a social awareness and personality trait that people want. Did it help you understand your students any better, like the way they lived? Because you know, the residence halls thing, I've never Well, more that. students lived in the residence hall then. By the time I left, almost all my juniors and seniors were in apartments. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. And um, what about post-retirement life? It seems like you're involved in I'm, I'm as busy as I want to be, uh -huh. um, and I'm loving retirement. I hope I'll have a long, happy, healthy one. Um, I retired a little early. I retired at 62. Oh. My husband was uh, had already been retired five years and I needed two knees replaced oh, and I, I heard and, about those knees. and I worked until I was working 12 months until the last year the last year I went to 10 months so getting it done in the summer and coming back just didn't look that good so mm -hmm. I decided I'll just go on and and retire at 62 and back then um, uh, well, back then, that wasn't that far away now, but um, the economy had been booming and everybody's retirement yeah. was doing great, mm -hmm. okay? It fell about the time I did, but we're fine. But Good. it would have been great if I if it had been another couple of years. But it, but I would have probably stayed because it got so bad, Yeah. you know. But um, I love retirement. I got involved in the Mario Matthews Club. Again, it's a, just a wonderful small group. We meet once a month. How did you get involved in that club? Or Karen Jameson, who was one of my teaching mentors mm -hmm. when I came here, was in that group, as well as Mary Alice Nebo, who had been the um, head counselor in CFS. That had, and before that, she was an associate professor in consumer sciences and retailing. Okay. So she went down to student advisor across her. Mm -hmm. Changed to student advising counseling. Um, Mary Fuqua, I knew all those women, and they were in the group. Okay. Okay. That's and a nice yeah, way to stay in yeah. Touch. It's a nice way to, 
it's just been a great way to stay in touch. We don't, now the school is much more diverse and we don't have that many retiring that would have, you don't have to have a home economics background. It's just we happen to have had. Yeah. And it's really made the group gel. Nice. But we won't be able to probably keep that. So this, it, this group will have to evolve too. Uh -huh. Well, who knows but it'll come but out we meet once a month, and we've never taken on something like this portrait. That's awesome. Because again, there are a lot of the women are eighty and ninety, and this we meet. We have a um, our dues are twenty dollars. We meet once a month in someone's home, so we've kept the group small. And um, I, I also joined the Purdue Women's Club, and I knew Patty Jisky really well because I had worked with her, and I knew Dr. Jisky. And um, I knew, I got to know all the presidents and their wives really well, mm -hmm. just being on, um, I was on a bunch of Senate committees and it happened to be the ones the president was sitting on, just happened. Oh. That, I mean, it was just happened. Uh -huh. I'm sure people could have a wonderful career here and never be on a committee with the president, but yeah. once a month I was. <laughs> and um, so I joined the Women's Club and it's a, got a great group that you might be interested in because it has a group for young women your age. Is that right? Yeah. That's just, uh, Patty Jisky was president last year and she was interested in getting that group started. Uh, I think partly because her daughter-in-law was here. Oh. Yeah. And she's in it. And I hear, um, so the, they, there's a 40 something interest groups. Uh-huh. And I'm are only you in one. I'm in a, a book club. Okay. And I love it. Okay, I'm reading books I would never have read. Oh, is okay. that right? And um, we have authors come in and talk to us. Like we had Angie come talk to us uh -huh. about her book. And she's already, um, we will have her back when her next book comes out. Okay. And that became a really good tie-in. In fact, that's kind of how it dawned on us. There's no portrait or plaque in Matthews Hall and we need to do something. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because we didn't get that on tape and I think that's important. So that's how it dawned on you. Well, um, we had Angie come speak to us about her book, mm -hmm. uh, Divided Past Common Ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, And it's a great title. It's the perfect title for that book. I don't know if you've read it, but yeah. you would find it uh -huh. very interesting. Because they're buried in the same cemetery but their paths became very divided when Lola Gaddis was moved across the street uh -huh. in the middle of the night uh -huh. by the Ag boys, yeah. um, uh, who then could control that part of the budget. And um, um, Mary Matthews tried very hard to get her back and didn't. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, was always kind of a little unspoken battle between the budget. Mm -hmm which came into the larger entity, which was the Ag administration, and then got divvied down to home economics. I think that's over now, but that was yeah. a long time getting over. But um, I don't even remember who said it. It wasn't Angie. She just got us to talking about it. Okay. And somebody said, has there ever, did they ever put a portrait in Matthews Hall, and we said no. I taught over there all the time, so I was pretty sure there wasn't, and uh, it just went from there. And we said, well, you know, that might be something we could do. So then I contact, I said, well, I was president, and I said, well, I'll kind of see what I can do about that. So I first contacted people like Betty Nelson because she was at the, they were at the tail end of Dorothy Stratton's portrait. Mm -hmm. We also had a person do a program on Dorothy. And um, I wonder who did that. it was Sally. Sally. Okay. Okay. Wonder, and Sally's a story in herself. Wonderful program. Uh -huh. And so I, uh, Betty's a neighbor of mine. Oh, is that Okay. Right? And Betty told me that gave me the name of the painter who's from Indianapolis and she said the painting cost $8,000 and that didn't include the frame and the securing and the hanging. Mm. And so <laughs> um, I knew right then we were going to have to, none, uh, none of the people in my group were now are former deans or yeah. women with a lot of money. 
right. Okay, uh -huh. and so they it, it wasn't that each member was going to be able to give thousands. Yeah. So, um, and we're not affiliated with the university or the Mario Matthews Club, but we're not. We were established under, in the 50s, under a, a group called the Federation of Clubs in Lafayette, uh -huh. and I think there's still a couple of clubs in that, maybe a woman's business group, and we were under Is that. that. Right? I was we were initially that. under whatever this federated clubs was, mm -hmm. and um, um, to the point that historically we used to have to uh, give them a copy of an audit of our books every year. Is that right? Yeah. And we don't do that anymore. We just audit ourselves every time we change treasures. It's uh -huh. just a $400 budget a year. Anyway, um, so I went to Betty, and she said, there are a lot of women on campus that would be interested in this, that are interested in this. And she gave me other names, and I met with other people, and I just started getting a groundswell coming. And um, it, it, it's odd the way that it happened, that one day in my book club, totally separate group, because uh -huh. the Purdue Women's Club isn't yeah. affiliated with Purdue either, but um, the president that year uh, happened to be in my book club, Karen Michener, and I suggested we have Angie come talk about the book, mm -hmm. and they had her, and they got fascinated about the story, and so I said, well, you know, we're um, investigating whether we can raise enough money to do this portrait won't be a portrait. By then, at that point, I didn't know it was going to end up being a print because that's all we could afford. And the president said, you know, I think Mary Ellen Matthews was active in the Purdue Women's Club. Well, it turns out that she was the fifth president well, in 1930, 31. And the president has made sure that you all know that now because that was not in the archives. Oh, that's right. She made it, add it to the website. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So this was just happened. So she's in this book club and here's us. And she said, well, gee, you know, the Purdue Women's Club might be able to financially help you. And they uh, underwrote half of it. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Oh, how cool. We, the Mary L. Matthews has a... $400 budget a year and we give it all away. We don't give our speakers an honorarium. Mm -hmm. We we give we sponsor alum campership Lafayette Urban Ministry. Oh, nice. We give to the Mary L. Matthews scholarship. There uh -huh. is a scholar endowed scholarship. We give to it each year and we give to the um, women's abused women why yeah, that that's where our money goes and it's, it's gone. We're down to $50. Okay, so um, whereas the dues for the Purdue Women's Club are not very much either, but they had a twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar budget. Hmm. Big club. Yeah, yeah, they have over five. Um, during Patty's year, it got over five hundred. Wow. Which was just last year. So the two groups went together. So on the plaque, you're going to see both names. Okay. The Mario Matthews Club and the Purdue Women's Club generously I, gave. I can't wait to see. Yeah, it. and then we solicited from anybody that had offered to help. Uh -huh. A lot of the and uh, people like Betty, that every every women's dean that was still alive gave yeah. us money. Uh -huh. Okay, and uh, people like Vic Lechtenberg's wife, Grace. She's in my committee mm -hmm. in my book club. She gave us a check. Just. They, they were just, when she heard about what all the Ag boys had done to the home ec, she said, oh, I'll help you with that. Yeah. She's yeah. a really sweet lady. She's just a real sweet. So it just grew. That's, cool. That's wonderful. It was wonderful. And now we're doing some joint things with that group. Uh -huh. the, our club is, and their club is uh, taking a bus to art exhibit in Chicago. Oh, yeah. And some joint things uh -huh. because that became we became known yeah. of each other. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, so that's how it happened. It's wonderful. And we did all of it um, without any help from the school. We didn't really expect any because the schools. It's important that they identify as their new school, Health and Human yeah. Services, and they don't go back and try to visit. But it's also important they don't forget their history. Oh, so yeah. we were very pleased that um, HHS Development um, uh, did the solicitation letter, oh, covered the postage, 
uh, did the program for the dedication. So they did some in kind. Did you have things. to twist their arm? To, um, to, to I worked them. with Christine, and we worked great. Christine Wright. Okay. Okay. To, to hang it, though, I mean. Oh, that's an interesting part of the is story. That right? <laughs> okay. This is an, this is a hilarious part of the story. Okay. Um, we, Mary O. Matthews is not affiliated with Purdue, and we had no way to say this is where we want this hung. Wait. And Mary, so where we were, Mary O. Matthews, we're no, we're not. Oh, the club. The club. Oh, yeah. Okay. And neither is the Purdue Women's Club. Uh huh. So um, we weren't going to be able to say I wanted hung right there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, I spent many hours in Matthews trying to figure out where to hunt it, hang it. Sorry. And um, people had ideas. Some people said up at outside the door of Matthews 210. That's the auditorium up there uh -huh. on the second floor because a lot of people come into the auditorium because. Unfortunately, it ended up being fine, but part of the process is, unfortunately, when you first go in from the side on the ground floor to Matthews Hall, which everybody thinks of kind of as an entrance, mm -hmm. the picture that you see is Lella Gaddis. Okay. There is a painting there of Lella Gaddis, uh -huh. which was paid for by the Indiana Home Economics Association, and it's hung in ag administration until she retired and then it came over oh, to Matthews. She came back home. Yeah, and although, and here we know all the history in this book, uh, that um, Mario Matthews and she kind of stayed friends, but it's just that they spoke to each other when they ended up at the same place. Is that how oh, it was? Kind of. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, because Mario Matthews wasn't in charge of her anymore and she was doing what her, what she was being paid to do, do mm -hmm. and. Mary was trying to get her back and couldn't, and so I don't I don't know what the feelings were, but the book kind of has an undercurrent to it that they remain cordial friends, but they didn't socialize together after that. Okay, they didn't yeah. socialize together, and they did before that. Oh. Okay, so here is this picture of Lella Gaddis, and it's a painting. And so one of the reasons I thought we were going to be forced to get a painting is there was room to put Mariel Matthews beside Lella Gattis, but it would not have looked right unless it was the same size and it was a painted portrait. Mm -hmm. A print wouldn't have looked right. Yeah. Okay. Um, also, there were some alums, in fact, um, Eva Goebel, kind of got a serious look on her face when we talked about maybe moving Lilla Gaddis's painting or suggesting. Not cool. Didn't seem <laughs> to be cool. And Lilla Gaddis's niece brings relatives here to see her portrait. Oh. And so, um, anyway, well, one day we were in Matthews. Oh, there's another funny part of the story. I hate for this to take That's away, okay. but this is hilarious. You need to go over there and walk up to the third floor in the stairwell and see this huge, gorgeous painting of a woman in a red velvet brocade dress. Huh. Um, beautiful woman, beautiful dress. She's not risque, but she's dressed like she's in a ballroom in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Okay. People thought that that was Mary Hill Matthews. Well. And, I mean. Who is she? Yeah. She has nothing to do with Purdue, almost. There was a instructor at Purdue, I assume must have been in clothing and textiles, who died while she was working, and her students, in her memory, went to Chicago and bought this painting. Oh. Yeah, and gave it to the school in her memory. Oh. And it was during Mary L. Matthews' tenure as dean and the plaque that goes with it um, almost leads you to believe that the woman is connected with Meredith, who was Mary mm -hmm. Matthews' adoptive mom. mom. Yeah. But it wasn't. It was just a picture that students gave in honor of this professor. And again, I'm assuming they were in textiles or something because it's a beautiful. The name of the picture is the red dress, or the lady in the red dress, something like that. And there's a plaque with it, but people don't read it. And so some people thought that was Mariel Matthews. So we first of all had to find out that's not Mariel Matthews. 
A lot of people thought Lola Gaddis was Mary Matthews. There's a plaque there mm -hmm. that identifies as Lola Gaddis. And so um, there was even a former um, development director of consumer and family science that thought that the lady in the red dress was Mary wow. Matthews. I mean, it, it went that there was that much misinformation out there. Okay. So when we finally figured out, no, and it's not, and no, we probably can't afford. I think if we had gone on for two or three years with the project, we could have raised the money for mm -hmm. a painting, okay? But the print looks beautiful, looks okay? And that we're gonna get a print, it was, well, where are we gonna put it? Well, we were over there one day trying to figure out where to put it, and one of the current counselors, because the HHS CFS part of it, counseling, is in Matthews now, mm -hmm. just walked by and she said, hey, Olivia, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing here? And I told her, and I said, we're wondering if we could do something here with Lella. And she said, well, you know, she said, this is hardly known by everybody yet, but this whole floor is going to be renovated to try to get eventually this is just last year, so this is not even a year ago. Eventually, it's going to be renovated so that all the counseling from HHS is there together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she said, when it gets renovated, I don't even know if that wall will be there. Wow. It's on a panel wall right now. She uh -huh. said, the plans have a, are, not, um, are not to the point yet that we've gone to get on the agenda of which year we'll yeah. get the renovation. Yeah. But she said, it's going to happen. So we thought, well, and she said at that time, Lella Gaddis's picture, if, if this is taken in as part of the offices, and I think it'll have to be because there's eight or ten departments now in the yeah. college, she said it'll be moved somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And we thought, well, that won't be us having to move. That'll be That's somebody right. else. Right. And it'll probably be the extension part of HHS that belongs to food and nutrition to mm -hmm. the old consumer part is in that building across the hall. So Lella probably will just be moved across the hall because she's extension. Yeah. So we went out into the foyer and we thought, there's nothing out here. Why? This is the entrance. Why don't we put it here? It was like Eureka moment. Uh -huh. But it wouldn't even have happened if she hadn't walked by and said, this is all going to be renovated. Don't put it here. Nice. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really interesting story the way it happened. And there was one painting out there that was just a landscape scene of the mm -hmm. Midwest, and we, it just as I you come in the, that. yeah, it's poppies or something. And Extension had bought it when their offices were there because it was so ugly out there. There's nothing there. You, mm -hmm. It's a big foyer, and then you go down a hall on each side yeah. through a door to go to counseling and the rest of Matthews. Uh -huh. But it's a nice foyer. There's um, it'll be uh, updated too. You know, yeah. there's right now the plants out there look kind of sickly and everything, <laughs> but that's where it is, cool. and and it's perfect because once the new building for HHS is finished, people that would walk up by Smith and cross the street would come into Matthews right in that door. Oh, good. And that and that is the official uni the university address for Matthews is mm -hmm. State Street. Mm -hmm. Nice. Anything else? Anyway, it took seven months to get through all this. Wow. Because we were just finding out new stuff. Yeah. Anyway. Seven months and <laughs> It took from November. Years. We we passed the motion to explore it in November and uh, we hunt it in October. The next October. That's and it was the summer, it was July or August before we figured out where it was gonna be. Any other upcoming projects with your Mary Matthews? No. We're just back and enjoying it. <laughs> That's over. <laughs> I really enjoyed that, but it, it took a lot of time. I had time. I wouldn't have had time if, I, you know, I really enjoyed it. And there were about two of us making all these decisions because yeah. there were the 80, 90 year olds were loving it all, but they weren't going to run around uh -huh. and decide and yeah. pick the colors of the blouse and pick what we were going to do and anyway Got but they were thrilled and is there anything else that you want to return to that we discussed I don't think lesson? so yeah all right well thank you very yeah. much um, we got off on some interesting tangents for uh -huh. you yeah